Typically, it is the man who wields the sword, who weaves and cleaves to enact the violence of his own will. Though if you thought this to be the case here, then you were wrong. This sword, the color of pitch, has its own desires, its own hunger. Umbra, darkness incarnate. This is the story of when the wielder becomes the wielded. Matisse Beaumont was once a knight of the Order of Saint Pelin, wearing the words of sacred oath upon his shoulders, a duty to protect Evermore and its people. He was a fierce combatant and yet a kind soul, protecting villagers from orcs, reavers, and reachmen. At the turn of the year 421, he ventured into the mountains of the Western Reach to slay a monster, a reported horned figure with a blade like night. For many suns and many moons, Beaumont searched the wind-chipped peaks until he found the cave where the foul creature hid. Sword at the ready, he entered and found not a monster, but a man, one of the Reach folk surrounded by the bodies of his kin. He was mad, Beaumont thought, a rabid animal touched by the Mad God, a price paid for flirting with the Daedra. Umbra wants your soul. The Reachman said as he prepared for his next victim. The clash of blades erupted, a duel worthy of the grand arena, confined to the corners of a dank cavern in the mountains. Saint Pelin's knights were no village militia, and in a final strike, the valiant hero lopped the Reachman's head from his shoulders, and strands of purple energy were drawn into the black sword that now lay on the ground. Beaumont approached and bent to take a grip of his prize. This was his slow death. Umbra had found a new host. The Soul Eater, the jet black sword of ultimate power and temptation, whose will consumes its wielder, Umbra. There are many small variations and theories on the story of its origin, but with some proper investigation, we can pull together a rather cohesive story that is most likely to be true. First, its creator, Nain Rawea, was likely counted among the natives of the Reach. Their stories say that Nain Rawea wore the witchwise headdress during her creation of the Umbra Sword, and Reach witches today honor her, for once they pass the final tests of wisdom set to them by the clan's elder, they gain the privilege to craft such an adornment and wear it with pride among their kin. In addition to that piece of cultural information, I also find that her name seems to be of the Reachman language, at least to me. Consider other Reachman names like Maverit, Nevean, Verfe, Arana, Kalea, and to me, Nainra easily fits in. The other consideration that makes me buy into this idea that she is of clear Reachman origin is the other component of Umbra's creation story. You are likely familiar with the Reachman systems of religion and how they are largely focused around the Daedric Princes. Well, the story goes that Nainra Wea did not simply make the Umbra sword for fun. After all, witches aren't typically the type of people you would imagine charging into combat with blade at the ready, and in that case even the powerful tool would likely be wasted in amateur hands. But Nainra was working for a Daedric Prince, a dynamic not uncommon in the Reach. Umbra's creation was requested by Clavicus Vile, the Daedric Prince of trickery and bargains, the master of insidious wishes. The story goes that Clavicus desired a sword which would send him souls from Nern, another device of trickery to further his mockery of mortals. Nainra, with all her magical powers, forged the soul-inked blade, yet it was unstable, or at least that is what she told Clavicus. She told Vile that he would need to lend her a piece of his power in order to stabilize the creation. The impetuous prince agreed, all too eager to have his new toy, and in that moment of haste, the Daedric Lord of Trickery was tricked himself, and the unstable sword became imbued with a piece of his power, and as a result, Umbra was born, a sentience of its own. Nain Rawea was executed for her evil creation, either by Clavicus or some other actor, but not before she could hide the sword. Some stories even say that Nain Rawea was in fact Sheogorath in disguise, and I mean anything is possible, but other than existing as a footnote of speculation, I don't see why this would be the case. But what we know for certain is that Umbra was born from a piece of Clavicus Vile's power imbued within the sword, and Umbra, as is written in the book Tamrielic Law, is very choosy when it comes to its owners, and remains hidden until a worthy one is found. Beaumont, Evermore, Saint Pelin, sacred oaths and chivalrous acts were all no more, only Umbra. Years since the cave, since he first gripped that sword, he has only wandered finding new souls to feed upon, living as the vessel for the blade which wields him. 
thanes and bandits, mages and necromancers, tales of a knight wielding a sword of black leapt from lip to ear, from mouth to mind, in whispers between tavern patrons, speaking of such stories to spook others around the fire. But what was told was true. Umbra roamed the land. Umbra trudged through the petalled ground of the rifts valleys, autumn leaves mashed into the mud beneath his boots. A parting in the forest revealed a stronghold, Lagashba, an orcish chieftain. He stood at the gates and pounded his fist upon the wood, shifting chips and splinters from the top into clouds of dust. Moments passed and soon the gates burst open and the chief of the orcs demanded the name of this intruder. I am Umbra and I challenge you. A chief of the orcish people could not deny such a challenge. To do so would dishonor him and undermine his right to rule, and so he accepted. Orcish grunts and roars echoed through the valley, followed by the tangs of steel and shedding of blood, and then a silence. The battle was over. The body of Matisse Beaumont lay bloody, armor impacted, and Umbra lay beside him. The orcish chief of Lagashba had bested the challenger, and well, it was only natural that he takes a trophy, and he knew a well-made sword when he saw one. Umbra hides not in a dank cavern corner, but in plain sight, as an unassuming possession. Its is a dark influence that consumes the mind of its wielder, to the point where the host's identity is almost entirely replaced with the will of the sword. This is the evil nature of Umbra. Arguably, some would call this a Daedric artifact. The creation of the sword was of course done by a mortal witch of the Reach, but it is a piece of Clavicus Vile's power that truly makes the sword. And anyway, there are multiple Daedric artifacts made by others, such as Volundrung made by the Dwemer, that are then claimed by the Princes of Oblivion. We know little in regards to dates when it comes to the creation of Umbra, but considering that in the Second Era, the cultural practices of the Reach folk surrounding the Witchwise headdress spoke of the ancient witch named Rawail, so one could assume that its origin is many thousands of years ago, probably sometime in the First Era. Despite the lack of time frame for its origin, we do know bits and pieces of its travels in the late Third Era. Umbra came into the possession of an orc by the year 427 of the Third Era, and he was in Vardenfell, near Saran, seeking challenges with a desire to die in battle. Culturally expected for the orcs, but perhaps in this case it was the influence of Umbra that he could bear no longer, and death would be a mercy. Regardless, the Nerevarine bested the orc and claimed Umbra for themselves. What exactly happened with the sword then is unclear, though it is unlikely that the Nerevarine succumbed to the will of the sword, either by the sheer strength of their own, or perhaps it is because Umbra was sold to Tarasa Aram of the Mournhold Museum, a wealthy Dunman noblewoman who made a habit of procuring a collection of rare artifacts from travelers, and well, the Nerevarine had come into the possession of a fair few of those in their travels. All we know is that next, six years later, in Cyrodiil, it was in the possession of a Bosma woman formerly known as Lenwin. The story has it that she was an apprentice to a Roke the Wide in Pell's Gate, and one day she found the sword, and it changed her. She started looking for fights, became bloodthirsty, ended up leaving Pell's Gate, ran with some mercenaries, and, well, she fell to the influence of Umbra. She began calling herself by that name, as almost all previous wielders had. The champion of Cyrodiil, or hero of Kavach, whatever name you choose, came into contact with Clavicus Vile and was instructed to retrieve the sword in exchange for his mask. It is interesting that Clavicus tells the champion that the sword contains the soul of Umbra, which he says is a hero that Vile has had dealings with in the past. I suppose that makes sense from his perspective. You wouldn't want to be telling people that part of your power grown sentient is locked within the sword that they are retrieving, for if they knew, they may be tempted to use it against him. The champion faced Lenwin, turned Umbra, and retrieved the sword. We don't know whether they exchanged it for the mask or kept it for themselves, but regardless, Umbra eventually found itself in the hands of Clavicus Vile once again, a reunion overdue by thousands of years. In the books Lord of Souls and Infernal City, the prince and his piece of power that is Umbra were reunited, and in the fields of regret, Vile's realm, Umbra even took the form of a man, a dark being with eyes like holes into nothing. Through a series of events too tedious and expansive to denote here, Umbra manifests as a sentience outside the sword, creates a floating city called Umbriel by tearing away a piece of Vile's realm, and eventually he would be recaptured within the sword and used to destroy the Ingenium. 
The Umbra Sword turned to smoke here, and it was believed that it was destroyed forever, with Clavicus Vile seemingly having reclaimed his lost power. But like many things Daedric in nature, they have a hard time staying dead and gone. In year 179 of the Fourth Era, a treasure hunter named Cressetus was exploring the mountains east of Shaw's Stone in Skyrim, and while doing so he slipped and fell down a hole, breaking both his legs. As it would turn out, he had stumbled upon, or should I say stumbled into, Champion's Rest a long-lost network of Nordic crypts once used as a gladiatorial arena for the great Nord champions of old. Cressetus' discovery was in vain, for he was stranded and dying, but that is when he began to dream of swimming in a sea of black. A jet-black sword called out to him, urging him to claim it, and when he awoke, the sword was lying beside him. He took grip as many others before him had, and well, you know, this is the end of Cressetus. His wounds healed as if by magic, and over time his mind was melded with the will of the blade. Umbrua remained here for many years, until year 201 when Silver Prospectors broke through to Champion's Rest while searching for ore, and they came upon what they said was a ghost wielding a whispering sword. The Vigil of Stendar caught wind of this anomaly, and based on their knowledge of their enemy, the Daedra, they correctly matched the descriptions provided by the miners to Umbra which had previously been believed to be destroyed. The last Dragonborn was enlisted to investigate Champion's Rest, and it is here where a legendary battle took place. The Dragonborn fought against Umbra and its soul images. A struggle, but Umbra's opponent had defeated Alduin, Harkin, and Mirak, the Ebony Warrior, and countless dragons. Umbra would lose. Well, that is to say that Cressetus was killed, and Umbra was claimed by the Dragonborn. In that way, I suppose, Umbra never truly loses. Perhaps this was its long-term goal, to take control of a being as powerful as the last Dragonborn. Perhaps they'd make a good team, one draining the souls of dragons and the other draining the souls of mortals. I would think, or perhaps I would hope, that like the other strong-willed heroes of old, such as the Nerevarine or the Hero of Kavach, the Dragonborn too would be able to maintain dominance over the sword, or perhaps have conjured the wisdom to abandon it in favor of other pursuits. But either way, I have a feeling that this is not the last we'll see of Umbra. The ancient Witch of the Reach, Nain Rowea, created a monster, never to be destroyed it would seem, like the Black of Night or the Endless Void. The Umbra Sword is eternal.